So in my last video, I talked about the rendering server and I ran a few benchmarks comparing the exact same scene, um, just using a bunch of nodes, using the multi-mesh instance 3D, and then using the rendering server. So the intent of that video was just to kind of show people that the rendering server is not as you know, potentially scary as it seems at first, and that there are some real performance gains that you can get by using it. So for some reason, people on uh, Reddit were arguing with me about the multi-mesh performance, which doesn't surprise me too much, but some people were saying that you do get frustum calling with multi-meshes, and I think there's just some confusion about that, right? You're gonna get frustum calling on the whole AABB of the entire set of instances. But the Godot documentation, it tells us directly, there's no screen or frustum calling for the individual instances. And for big scenes that have these big models, that's where a lot of the uh, performance is lost because you have models in the background that are 30,000 triangles when they should be 100, right? So, and they also say, you know, millions of objects will always or never be drawn. And we saw that in the test that I ran in the last video. So just to recap the benchmarks that I went through, I had that same animated flyby scene. So in the multi-mesh case, we can see we're getting about, you know, 40, if we're being generous, 40 FPS. And the total primitives drawn is about 55 million. And that is very, very constant. Uh, we get a little bump up here at the start. But once everything is, um, you know, I suppose loaded into the rendering pipeline, we get that constant 55 million. And unsurprisingly, we just get the four draw calls, right? This is dependent on how your shadows are set up. There's just one draw call for the whole multi-mesh. So we're doing better on draw calls. I should note that these days, you know, any computer made in the last 10 years, draw calls are not really our bounding issue anymore. You can have 10,000 draw calls, you know, kind of as an upper limit, I would, I would say, but that can run stably. If we look at the performance for the rendering server for the exact same uh, scenario with auto LOD, um, here at the end, we have 60 frames per second, but we can see as we were driving through that level, uh, the FPS was increasing quite a bit, up to about 140 at least, as we were kind of diving into those levels, right? And things were getting occluded, things, the frustum calling was happening. And of course, we uh, were getting lotting, the Godot's auto lotting happening. Primitives drawn were, you know, significantly lower, around 22 million. And then the draw calls are somewhere between 11 and 30. What I'm going to show you today is that manual lotting can give you a huge, huge boost in performance. Some people actually mentioned this in the YouTube comments. They were 100% right. Manual lotting, if you know what to do, if you know what to look for, um, can give you massive, massive gains in performance. So uh, we're hitting a baseline of about 300 frames a second, maybe a little less, 250 at the worst, and then up to 600 frames per second. And just so you know, I have VSync off. I'm letting the system run unbounded just so I can test performance. And our draw calls, once again, we're in that range of you know maybe 30 to 60 draw calls. So we have a few more draw calls this time, which makes sense because I'm manual lotting and each one of those you know, constitutes a draw call. So I'm just going to hop over to Blender first to show you what my three LODs are. So here's LOD 0 on the left. Um, and LOD 0 is not actually at 100% uh, of the original mesh that I pulled from the internet. I'm actually decimating it to 50%. Because what I kind of noticed here is that if this is at 1 or if this is at 0.5, there's virtually no difference in how that mesh looks. LOD 1 I have at 10% decimation, and that brings this triangle count down to 6900. And then LOD 2... Uh, goes all the way down to about 1300 and what I noticed is if I went much lower than this then the mesh kind of Kind of totally breaks and you know, I that's my strategy when you go for the lowest lot you just tune this down until uh, You know, it gives the same visual idea of what you're looking for, but doesn't destroy the geometry entirely, right? I think that's a reasonable approach um, you know, modeling purists might have some issue with that. Of course, there's no subdivision workflow here. There's no nice quads. This is just a model that was uh, more or less kit bashed together. Uh, just to show you my export settings for a second. For this model, I am doing just visible and I'm going to include modifiers when I export. So that decimation gets applied to my meshes. Uh, another thing you might want to consider is just making sure that your scales are all set to one. So hopping over to the Godot side for a second, there's a couple differences we will notice here um, on the import side of things. We do have our three LODs here on the GLTF file. And I think this is a nice gut check that, you know, your models are de decent for these, for these level of detail. Um, so we can see LOD 2, we lose the pillars, but we have the same basic shape. All of the basic geometry is there. Even the back from the distance, honestly, you know, honestly still looks quite good. I think you could do more manual work to tune this up and reduce this, but um, you know, for my purposes, this is quick and easy, and that's what I went with. 
The other big thing you need to do when you're going to do manual lotting is you need to, on your model, you need to turn off uh, generate lots. Because if you don't do that, then Godot is going to try to auto lod the manual lodge that you're working with. If I just boot up the scene, we'll do the same flyby here in the here in the window. And let's pull up some performance so you guys can see that screenshot that I showed you. So um, the pop in is about the same. The only pop in you really notice is the shadows changing, right? The shadows change as you move through the level because, um, you know, the shadows are interacting with those models slightly differently at those different levels of detail. So that's one artifact that I think you could possibly tune up, but it would take a little bit more effort to make that happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, our performance is way, way better here. We're under like half a million triangles. Um, this is totally doable for a scene like this. And of course, this opens up the possibility of just building out bigger and bigger worlds when you load things properly. In the editor here, we can we can see those shadow transitions much more clearly. We can kind of focus on on them, right? So let's try to isolate one. Here's one. So you see the shadow around the doorway. We zoom out, zoom in. We can see that lot happening. It is happening gradually, and that's because of uh, there's a, a distance fade setting we can look at. But let's take a look at the code. It's really not um, too complicated compared to the rendering server code that we looked at yesterday. So we still have the instance RIDs here. I'm still just generating a you know 20 by 20 grid. And then the magic happens in these generate buildings function, which I added a couple of parameters to. So the generate buildings function, I'm just adding uh, a mesh property, uh, min max, and then the mid margin and max margin. So um, really the only line of code that's changed is on each of these rendering instances, we're setting the geometry visibility range. So we, we check the, our ID that we're working with here, and then min, max, min, margin, max, mar margin. I'll explain that in a sec. But visibility range fade self, these are all individual instances, so there's no like uh, parenting or relationships between them. So we're just gonna have them fade on, the, on themselves. The way you kind of look at this, so I have a couple variables here. Distance one is 20 meters, distance two is 100 meters, and there's a margin of six meters. So basically, lot zero is going to be visible zero, meaning you can be as close as you possibly want to be to it. And then at around um, distance one is 20 plus six. So 26, we start to fade out and we'll go out to that uh, margin, that fade out margin, right? So that's the um, max margin. There's no, the min margin is zero because it's always visible as, as close as you are to the objects. And then so uh, for the next LOD, we have distance minus the margin, so 20 minus 6, so at 14, this guy starts to fade in, right? And we can actually take a look at this in a sec. Um, and then this will go until distance 2 plus the margin and then fade out. And then, you know, the third LOD, LOD 2, this guy will start fading in around distance 2 minus that margin. So they have this blending kind of thing happening, right? So if we just look at, say, LOD 0, all right, so now we just have the LOD zeros and we can see like this is this is how close you need to be to see the high fidelity. And I could probably push this out a bit further if you want to see that, um, you know, a bit further off in the distance. But here's here's what it looks like. Right. So just LOD zero. Um, you don't really see anything except unless you're about this close. Right. All right. So let's take a look at LOD one. So we could turn on LOD one generate. And LOD1 actually fades out, right? So it fades out as you get close to it to allow LOD0 to kind of take over. But we can see LOD1 is actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Um, and of course, this, this allows us to see detail about out to this horizon. So if you look real carefully, I kind of tuned it so that it's kind of hard to see. But if you look for these pillars, so we can see one here, I can see one there, I can see one here, here, here. You can see a pillar all the way to this edge, but the next LOD, LOD2, won't have those pillars because those meshes obviously are decimated um, more heavily. So let's do that. We're going to clear, save, generate, and here's your LOD2, right? So we can just see they're off in the distance. Um, these don't have pillars, but it's actually quite hard to make out because once again, they're so small on the screen that you can't really see that kind of level of detail. So that's it. Uh, the script is really not complicated. Um, like I said, if you if you watch the previous video, it's the exact same uh, rendering server script. I just popped in a visibility range and you can tune those ranges yourself. Yeah, these are going to be three separate instances to do your own manual lotting here. But 
when the visibility range is off, you got to understand that the Godot engine, it's not just, it doesn't render all of these instants all the time. If, if something is not visible, it gets called from the, the rendering pipeline. So we do have some nice fading, right? That's handled with the, the transparency and it also calls it, right? So, um, to my eye, I can't see any visual pop in or any real defects here. And this is, this is why you definitely should consider manual lotting. Of course, you can do this with nodes. I just wanted to show it with rendering server to do something a little bit different. Um, there's lots of videos out there on how to do it with nodes. So yeah, I think this is a really good optimization uh, you should consider. Manual lotting has huge, huge potential performance uh, benefits. And I'm not afraid to say it is a 10x benefit over the just plain multi-mesh case where we're naiv naively throwing a model in and seeing what will happen. Right. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this was a little different. You know, I'm not I'm not doing it with nodes. I'm doing it with rendering server. So, you know, there's tons of videos out there on how to do uh, manual lotting. So I thought I might do it a little bit differently. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.